Welcome to the zoo. Today we're going to talk about analytics in the world of IT. And few people are better versed in explaining that to someone like me than Rob Enderley, an industry analyst. Welcome to the zoo, Rob. Thanks for having me. And of course, Aaron Avery calling in from Dallas is going to help me keep this on track and make sure I make cool of stuff. Let's start at a higher level, Rob, and, 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 and maybe for, for in a few sentences, explain to the audience, what is analytics within IT? Why you, do you need it and where do you get it from and how does it help? Well, analytics in IT, it's kind of an interesting thing because if, if you think about it, most of the ana analytics tools we have in market are targeted at market things. And the biggest buyer of analytics tends to be marketing. And what analytics does is it takes a bunch of information and turns it into, I should say data, and turns it into actionable in information. So it takes, say, a demographic, a set of demographic data and it can tell you what that demographic likes, uh, and it might even tell you how to approach that particular demographic. But historically, IT has been kind of left in the lurch with regard to most of these tools. And when we talk about CRM tools, well, IT doesn't necessarily get those a lot. And we talk about uh, Salesforce automation tools, well, IT doesn't get those a lot. And, and you might say, well, why would IT need Salesforce automation tools? Well, because IT is a service organization serving a customer base. And if it doesn't know whether that customer base is happy enough or not, it doesn't really know whether it's doing a good job or not. And that's one of the reasons why Amazon's come up and, uh, and surprised IT because Amazon does have these tools and they basically, in many cases, take the place of IT and supplying their services. So analytics for IT allows them to take information that they're looking at, be it about their environment, be it about their infrastructure, be it about their topology, and then figure out what's wrong, what's inefficient, what needs to be worked on, what maybe what needs to be patched. In fact, in an ultimate sense, it might even be able to identify certain kinds of threats that other tools don't pick up, say ransomware is starting to spread through underneath the lines of, of, uh, of their antivirus and security products. It's very possible an analytics tool could pick that up and show them that they've got a problem. And even if it's intelligent enough, tell them a bit about the problem and what they need to do about it. So, so Strangely enough, even though analytics flowed to IT last, it may actually be the most important organization to get analytics because these are the guys that have to teach everybody else about the tools they get. They're the ones that have to implement it. And finally, they're really the ones that need this data if they want to keep all of us up and running. And, you know, an analytics tool that we were to have a failure with the Blab would probably be able to help tell us what the problem is and, and help us get to a solution. Aaron, you've been in this space for a little bit of time. Uh, what's the problems today? I want to hear your point too, of a Rob around it. What's the problems today? If I'm an IT organization, I hear this, I, I start to realize, you know, you're right. I need more data. You can't be sitting here guessing. In a few bullets, how can, what's wrong and how can we fix those? Yeah, so I wouldn't say that anything is wrong per se. I think that the tools and the techniques, the um, processes that we've used for years, help us solve very specific defined problems. But what's happened is in the digital economy where everything talks and everything is connected, what we need to pay attention to is beyond the scope of you know, human capability, quite frankly. And additionally, the way that the tools and te you know, technologies and processes that we've used in IT for years that we've honed, that we've just, just made so precise to help us make sure we're keeping things performing and available and meeting end user expectations. Um, those tools and processes weren't designed for the agility and speed requirements that come with the digital economy. You have to be able to make a very precise data-driven decision in real time. And real time could be a matter of seconds or it could be a matter of minutes or hours for your business, but real time is faster than it's ever been before. And so what's What's really changed is that IT organizations have just this extraordinary opportunity, quite frankly, um, and, and Rob talked about this a little bit, to be these custodians of, of information and insight. And custodian kind of sounds like a neg negative word, but maybe thought leader or pioneer would be a better way to approach it, um, to use data to help drive these very um, prescriptive and precise decisions, because in a a world where it comes down to fast decisions, you really don't have the luxury of 
making a gut decision or a decision based on gut instinct. Um, because if you do that, you don't, and it's wrong. <laughs> I mean, there's this whole notion of fail fast, but some decisions you fail fast and then you just fail permanently. Um, so there's an opportunity for IT to be much more data driven and look at data in a completely different way. And to Rob's point earlier, really start to pioneer new data driven behaviors in digital organizations and digitally evolving organizations too. Rob, you remember the days, she doesn't because she's too young, when IT thanks was king. They <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. I'll pay you later, Al. <laughs> <laughs> IT gave us our first phone, our first laptop. Or, I mean, no, the personal computers was something you barely heard of, right? They were the one who explained what voicemail was and so on. Today, my daughters, who are teenagers, probably rigged a more sophisticated Wi-Fi system than a lot of corporate offices have. <laughs> In our own house, uh, people with Nest has more sensors and and, and data flowing in, in. What happened? Where where did IT fall behind? Because it's part of their reasons. They are part of the problem. Why the solutions are not as strong as they should be, or the data is not used in the same way. Well, recognize that IT is a service organization, and IT is often at the mercy of the vendors that serve it. And I think at the core or the heart of the problem is we focused on data first and information second. So. We had this big thing about big data. In fact, we look at IoT, it's all about capturing data, capturing the sensor data, capturing the, the customer data, capturing, and so we're, we're, we're really great at capturing data. In fact, we, that big plant in the middle of the country that the NSA has is capturing tons of data, massive amounts of data. It's all pretty worthless because what we they should have started with- They might be this lab session. <laughs> well, they can, yeah, well, that, well, they probably are and don't know what to do with that. Don't either. know what to do with that. <laughs> a bunch of guys show up with guns and black suits at my door. You'll see me run out the back. So there's, there's the clip. But, the, uh, but it, it was the focus on data, not the focus on information. In fact, if we saw the recent battle between <laughs> Apple and uh, the FBI, the focus, the focus was on getting more data without them actually sitting back and realizing that there probably wasn't anything on that phone that they could use to begin with. It, it wasn't about getting actionable information. It was just about acquiring more and more data. And there was the problem. We should always start with a clear goal in mind. What is it we want to do with this stuff as opposed to let's just get lots of stuff and figure it out later? Because the problem then becomes you got lots of stuff to weed through it. And that stuff can be a job in and of itself. And that's where IT, I think, fell behind or fell off is this focus. And it was driven by the vendors. It's not IT's fault. This focus on get, getting lots and lots of saving lots of stuff, backing up lots of stuff, storing lots of stuff. In fact, when you talk about this, I've been involved with e-discovery for a while. Often all this data is, is used more effectively by somebody that is suing you than it's used by yourself to, to prevent you from being sued because the company doesn't know anything's going wrong and that data all exists so the crime can be proven even though the executive management was completely unaware that the thing was going on in the first place. So it's that focus on data that screwed us up as opposed to thinking about, okay, we need to make decisions. If we need to make decisions, we need to have this kind of information. And if we need this kind of information, then we need to selectively look at these data elements and have them flow in so that some tool can make sense of them and help us make the decisions we need to make. Because we approach this, excuse the term, ass backwards, we're now kind of digging out of a hole before we've got way too much information, excuse me, way too much data and not enough information from which we can make decisions. And so that's what analytics is now trying to fix. And of course, one of the core problems with analytics is because we've got some of this complexity is often it requires a data scientist to figure out how to make the tool work. And the data scientist has no more clue about the, the question that's being asked than the person that's actually asking it. The ideal person to deal with the tool is the actual manager that needs the answer but we've often made these tools so complex yeah. that that person cannot get through the data to the information they need to do it. And so they're still using, they, they deploy some huge data analytics tool. They have no clue how to use it. In fact, they're probably half scared about it. And, mm -hmm. the, and, the, and the end result is they spent tons of money and they're still making the decisions the old fashioned way. Yeah. This is where I ought to go. Yeah. yeah. With the, yeah. You said something interesting that I've been wondering. How do you, how do one convert, how does one convert information or data into information or knowledge? Um, how do I make these bits turn into something actionable? Well, that's what the, that's, that's, what the, the, that's what the analytics tool does. And, and increasingly, we're making them intelligent so they can 
seek out and look for stuff that fits within the matrix of the decision so that they can apply it. By the way, I've glossed over a whole nother problem here because as I said, what we have is we have data, we have a tool that converts that data to information. One of the other big problems that has recently cropped up is assumptions are being applied to the data side and damaging the information side. I'll give you an example. A while back, Amazon had a problem. Their entire center of the, of, the, uh, of the country was showing huge dissatisfaction with regard to delivery times. Uh, Amazon is massively uh, instrumented. They've got huge analytics tools that tell them exactly what's going on and exactly why it's happening. Except in this particular case, they have these huge, massive dissatisfaction uh, scores coming through. And other tools were saying everything was running just hunky-dory. There was no problem. They went back and looked at it. It turned out a central distribution center and distribution centers were not supposed to, the central ones, are only supposed to deliver to other distribution centers. This distribution center, the manager decided to help out and was direct shipping to the customer instead of going to the, to the satellite centers. The guy that set up, or the people that set up the analytics tool said, well, this, this is impossible. So we won't capture any data that has to do with a central distribution center shipping out because they're not shipping to customers. And so it won't have an impact yeah. on those customers, but they were doing it. And that meant the analytics tool did not, could not yeah. see the problem. And it was only after they went in forensically and traced back the issues and discovered that they weren't being captured by the tool that they discovered it. So it, it showcases the, you still want to capture yeah. as much data elements as you can surrounding your decision because you want the tool to make the determination about whether it's relevant or not. If you do it at the front end, then the tool doesn't see it. It's effectively blind and it's going to miss the problem that occurred. Yeah, and I think one of the things that Rob is really illuminating here is this notion of data sources. And that, you know, we're, we're not at a point where we're eliminating the need for human, you know, for the gray matter up here. In fact, I would argue that the gray matter, you know, our ability to think critically is more important than ever. But we need to focus the work that we're doing, the analysis that we're doing, the decisions we're making. Um, we, we need to let the tools and the analytics actually do the work, help us get to some conclusions and then make the decisions based on the data on probability and risk and things of that nature. And that's where the human element is, you know, we're still a long way from, from, um, from automating all of that. I mean, there are some interesting things in the marketplace, general analytics solutions that can do things like win against Jeopardy. But the, the reality is that for most organizations, the real talent, and Rob made this point, you want the data and the insight in the hands of the people that understand the business and that need to, you know, need to execute on those decisions and live with the consequences, you know, good or bad of those decisions. And so when we go back to the example that Rob gave, um, it's important to think about what could be when you're looking at data sources. One of the best conversations that I get to have with customers is we talk about what are the challenges, the decisions that you're making, what are the big problems over the next six to 12 months that you are you're looking to tackle, not just how quickly do you want to fix something or tune that, what are the what are the initiatives? And then the, the question I follow that up with always is, and what are the sources of data that are going to help you make that decision? If you could have access to any data at all, what would you use? And when those conversations are, are just amazing and fruitful and illuminating um, for me, listening to how people go about decision-making, but also for customers, because when they really get going, and they don't think about what they have in front of them. They think about what they should be using. They really start to think broadly and contextually. And then one last point I'll add is it's not just about data sources. It's about putting data sources in the context of each other so that you can get to that big business picture, whether it's something about how do we generate revenue? How do we control risk? Maybe a risk associated with um, customer satisfaction in Rob's example, or, you know, even optimizing control costs. Mm. So Rob, how do you advise your customers, uh, your clients uh, in your end of the group? That comes as I would have and say, yes, where do I start? How do I base my uh, selection of data sources? Is, it, is there some simple best practices that I can start with? Well, yeah, you first bring on board somebody that understands the tools and understands your industry. Yeah. I, 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 will, I will point out that one of the things you really do need to do even before that with an analytics product is make sure that management will accept it. 
often, and this is, this is a problem in all companies, as people come up in a company, the folks at the low end are very conversant with the technology because they just cannot come out of school. They're the ones with hands-on, then they go to the first line, second line, third line. Now they become an executive. They become so far removed from technology and so afraid that somebody's going to find out that they don't really know enough about this stuff that, 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 that they cover it up. And yet they'll still make decisions the way they always do. They might have a tool, they might know the buzzwords, but they won't use it. And so the first step is to make sure you have a way to convert the folks that need to use the tool into advocates of the tool, not barriers to it. They can't just tell you what you wanna hear. You've gotta make sure that they become comfortable. Here's where it's kind of critical, I think, is that that person, that those resources that you bring in, they have to be trusted by the executives so they can help mentor the executives, first convince them that they need to be mentored and it won't be embarrassing to admit that they don't really know how this stuff works, and then bring them up so that they understand that it's far better to have the tool than to get fired. Because that's really what it often comes down to. When you have these kinds of problems, like well, right now, Apple's cascade, Apple looks like it's entering a cascade. Tim Cook's in a lot of trouble. I will almost guarantee you that he had tons of warning and there were tools that came in the information that came in that would have allowed him to avoid it, but he systematically ignored the symbols. And now Apple stock is, is, is crashing and worse, their sales are dropping off. All avoidable. Uh, most of the mistakes that Steve Ballmer made at Microsoft, which cost him his job, all could have been, and he was a data-driven guy, all could have been avoided with data-driven solutions, but he didn't look at them. He made gut-driven decisions instead. And he had a cascade that eventually resulted in his firing. He didn't step up to the technology and understand it well enough to use it effectively. And that's really the first step. You, you have to make sure you have a path to getting the people that need to use the tool to actually use the tool. Then you can flow through and actually build it. But if you can't cross that particular barrier, you're gonna spend a lot of money and you're gonna waste that money. Yeah, there's three things that I always think about when when it comes back to data analytics and ultimately getting to some sort of insight that you can use. It comes down to um, culture, process, and technology. And if you don't get all three of those things right, if, if you only get two of them right, It'll yeah, it, it, it's not going to go anywhere. And to the examples, multiple examples um, of some pretty great companies that had the chance to to change things, and, and obviously um, some didn't, and some are struggling with that right now. Well, and, and I should point out, often people look at those three elements and they say, well, you know, I can do two of them, but the third one's yeah. really hard. The culture thing is, is really hard. And so I'll do the two because you know two's good enough. No, two is not good enough. It's, it's like having a three-legged a three stool. <laughs> two legs is not good enough. You have to have all three <laughs> legs. And, and, the, and I've, I've done a, a number of sales reviews where we've walked in and looked at these you know, multi-million dollar sales events. And then, and then the company goes, well, why did we lose? Well, invariably because there were a series of things they knew they had to do. They were all requirements and they took the hardest one and said, yeah, we're not gonna do that. Mm -hmm. They still spent the money, went through the effort and then they lost the business. They would have been better off just staying home and playing Twinkies because the, the uh, dominoes because the Twinkies, uh, dominoes because the, uh, uh, the, uh, the money they spent building something that was just a complete waste of time. Rob, when you when you come yeah. back to the lab next, we're going to play dominoes. <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's been a long while since I played dominoes. Listening to you two, sounds like we will look back at this uh, in time, and we will almost look superstitious, like we witches cooking up a brew and looking in the smoke for what what direction take a company and we're not talking about some funny startup who doesn't have time to look well to get it right or some dying steel mill in Pittsburgh. We're talking about two of the biggest companies that people have heard of Microsoft and Apple. If you look at other companies more consumer is the consumer world better at data driven decision because they know how to deal with data versus enterprises like large business to business companies. Is there a big gap there? Well so it's kind of funny. I, don't, I actually don't think so. I actually think it's easier for enterprise focused companies uh, than it is for consumer companies because there are less data elements to, to, uh, to deal with. But the fact of the matter is, is the enterprise companies have a very different kind of problem. Often they have a council of customers that they talk to and they, and they figure that those customers are representative of the world and they're, they very seldom are. The enterprise companies tend to be very unique 
very individualized. And if you take a look at, you know, 12 large companies, I'm using Microsoft again, I, I had a conversation with Steve Ballmer years ago and he said, you know, I don't know how people figure I can do, do this job well. I've got, you know, 1 million customers. I've got, I've got 12 companies on my enterprise board. I can't, I mean, I can't drive this down into something that's, that's actionable or, or, or I can make a decision from That's exactly why, by the way, it's analytics is supposed to do. The issue is, is you need to take raw data, you need to crunch it, you need to turn it into information, and from that you make decisions. Mm -hmm. the, the enterprises tend to have enterprise boards and it tends to be the squeakiest wheel that gets the grease and the people tend to override the data. Yeah. On the consumer side, yes, you have lots of people, you have to break them down to demographics. So why the marketing organization is so keen on demographics for advertising, but what consumer organizations break is that same organization should have insight into the design of the products. So the products are created so the marketing organization can sell them. And the only company that actually did this expressly well was Apple under Steve Jobs. And it was because he personally went down and drove the process. The only time I'd ever seen the CEO personally go down, go in and say, you get this right, or you guys are history. And it, by God, it worked. Most valuable company in the world, most successful CEO of the decade. And you know the screwy thing of that? Everybody looked at that particular model and said, yeah, we're not doing that. So, the, so the, <laughs> the, 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 I shouldn't say everybody, there are actually two companies now trying to build similar models inside the, their firms. But, but I would have thought it would happen five years ago when, when Apple hit their record. So, the, so the, the, the end result is, is both sides, both consumer and enterprise focused companies have really difficult problems to solve. They just have to be very difficult problems. And the enterprise side, it's a bit more difficult because they have these damn customer councils that can override the data. And, the, and that makes it difficult. The consumer side might have focus groups can override the data, but if the focus groups are done right, they actually can make a decent data source. You just have to remember that focus groups are crap when it comes to predicting anything. So, so we want to listen a little bit less to our customers and, and much more to our data. Well, that's it. You, you, you have to, you, the goal is to have, uncompromised data flowing into something that does analytics without bias that chunks out decisions yeah. that the decision maker can do without an interface. Every time you drop a data scientist in between the decision maker and the product, you've got, you've got the possibility of bias being entered. And because it's a human, it's really hard to get that bias out. It's much easier to work bias out of a system because it doesn't really care. But with a human, you know, almost everybody will say, you know, I'm unbiased. I'm, Republican, I'm Democrat, whatever it is during an election. Well, that's the bias. So, the, so that at the, at the end of the day, you really want the information to flow through to the decision maker with as little juggling by a person in between as you can so they can use their experience to take that information and make a decision. Otherwise, there's that risk that whoever is at the intermediary is uh, manipulating the decision maker, which happens way the hell too much. So Rob, I actually have a question for you. Um, yeah. What is your, if, if you could give people a starting place, Alf asked a really good question about best practices earlier. Yeah. But I think for, for many organizations, when we say um, it's culture, it's process and technology, they go, oh, where do I start? Or where, where can I start to influence that? So I guess if you, do you have a starting place or a couple of starting places that maybe people should consider? Yeah, well, I, you, really you need to start educating the decision makers on the values of making decisions based on data-based information. So that, mm -hmm. so that rather than using whatever they've learned to do over the years in terms of how they make decisions, their gut, their, their feeling, what their friends yeah. tell them. Yeah. Their Trusted that, advisors, that, yeah. The, the, the first step is to make them believers in data-driven information. That's the first step. I mean, it's, it's one of the things that's kind of wiped me out with regard to this political system that we've had, we have here is there was one presidential candidate that actually had a great group of folks that gave data-driven information to them. That was the current sitting president, President Obama. And, 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 the, and I spoke to his CIO and it was just a brilliant organization. And you saw, and we actually looked at him versus Romney. And it should have been Romney that had that particular mindset that cares it was a business guy and businesses should be run by information. Politicians normally run much more on insight, feeling, emotion. So that, so the, but, it, but Romney, didn't understand the tools. I, I would argue Obama didn't necessarily either, but but he understood how to hire people that did. And the end result was is they were able to make the decisions and he won the election. Now, the, of course, one of the really sad things is that same mentality wasn't driven into government. And as a result, 
we've had issues. So the, so the, at the end of the day, if you can't convert the decision maker, you won't get to the, to the data driven positive mm-hmm. results that justify the entire, the entire effort. So you have to convert the decision maker first. You can start down low in the organization and work up, by the way, you can do a cascade. If you can't do the top guy, do the bottom guy. So at least they're making decisions based on data. Use that to move up. And as they advance in the company, they'll carry that mentality with me, with them. But they, but you have to have a way of taking that religion of, of unbiased data-driven decisions and moving it through the company. Otherwise, it won't hold. As we're coming to the end of this, and I truly enjoy talking to you, Rob. I hope we can do this more often. I enjoyed it. If I'm a company, whether I'm large or small, um, I may or may not have the funding or the the guts to really make a large investment. Is implementing a product or a system that can help me become a data-driven decision maker expensive? Does it have to be big? It sounds like like an ERP system has to be put in place, or is that just some misconception? Well, so fortunately, in in this day and age, we have um, software, software as a service tool, SaaS tools. Uh, the, the, and that, those tools, they charge based on usage. You know, historically, if, if you went back to the 80s, if you wanted to do anything that was data-driven, you had to buy a mainframe, uh, you had to get the terminals, you had to hire the people. And so you really only had technology in the, in the Fortune 500. Uh, but now with SaaS, you can get to analytics tools at a far lower rate. Uh, granted, you have to make sure that the data itself is secure because that's some of the issues with regard to some of these cloud services. Yeah. But you can actually get in relatively inexpensively. And certainly you can get in and start to understand the tools relatively inexpensively, where before you would have had to work for one of these large companies or actually be one of these large companies to do it. So it's it's actually a lot easier today to get to some type of an analytics-driven model than it's ever been mm-hmm. in the past. So you can scale as you see more and more value coming into the business. Exactly right. Erin, anything else to add? No, I think that Rob's got some fantastic insight. He's done extensive research and his conversations with customers definitely lead him to data-driven insights. That's that's for sure. So appreciate all of the insight that you have to share with us, Rob, and with our audience today. So thanks for being here. My pleasure. And, and Rob has a great blog, uh, <laughs> IT Business, that you should follow up on. Um, and if you need uh, help, he runs a wonderful consulting firm. So. Thank you so much, Rob, for entering the zoo. I appreciate your time, and hopefully we'll talk again. Thank you, Arian. My pleasure. Bye, everyone. For the rest of you out there, take care. Be safe. Bye-bye.